All right, so this is the second lesson in Lucas diagrams. And you're gonna realize that this lesson is a lot more difficult than the previous one <clears throat> because we're gonna be studying Lewis diagrams that have expanded valences, so more exceptions to the rule. And it is in this lesson that formal charges really shine, okay? You, you're gonna need formal charges for basically every single question. All right, so before that, uh, let's do a quick review. So take like two minutes to fill out these four. Write the, uh, draw the Lewis diagrams for the following, and then I'll quickly take them up just um, for a review. Just make sure you know how to do the basic one before we move on to the harder ones. So I'll take two. All right, so for the first one is quite simple. Uh, carbon monoxide is C triple bond with oxygen. The next one is a little bit more harder. Um, it's carbonate with CO3, two minus. So the structure will look something like this, uh, carbon in the middle with three oxygens. You would have the two oxygens that have a single bond with a formal charge of negative one. That's okay, because the net charge is negative two. So you gotta have formal charge somewhere. Uh, C is actually pretty easy, it's water. <clears throat> uh, here is the structure for H2O. The key thing to note about water is that you must draw water as a bent molecule. If you draw water as a linear molecule, if you just align the two hydrogens in a straight line, I will mark it wrong because water is not linear. If you study the angle of the bonds between the two hydrogens, it is not 180 degrees, okay? Water is bent, and this has really significant consequences on like our lives. That we can survive because water is bent. If water was straight, then water would be nonpolar, and we wouldn't be able to survive on water. So make sure that you bend the water molecules. Okay, the last one is a little bit weird because of PCL5. Here's the structure. I don't know if you got that one. Phosphorus making five different bonds with chlorine. Let me think, how is that possible? How can phosphorus make five bonds? Right? Phosphorus has five valence electrons, so it's only missing three. Shouldn't phosphorus make three bonds and not five? And that's exactly what we're gonna study today. Some elements, they can make more bonds and exceed eight valence electrons. We're gonna talk about what those elements are and why. So these are called expanded valences. So these valences are greater than eight. Which atoms can do this? Well, if you're an atom that is found on the third row of the periodic table or below, you're able to do this, okay? When N is three or greater, you can do this. Meaning that the first and second rows you cannot have expanded valences. Right, now, why is that? Well, because if you want to have an expanded valence, if, if you want to accommodate more electrons, more than eight, you've got to find more orbitals to put them in. All right, and if you're in the fir uh, first and second row, you can't find any more orbitals because 2s2, 2p6, that's your eight. How are you going to get more orbitals in the second energy level? You don't have any more. However, in the third energy level, you have 3s2, 3p6, that's your eight. But if you want more, well, you can put them in the d orbital because the 3d orbital is empty. Okay, so you can just drop them in the 3d orbital. That's where you will stash your extra electrons. Okay, does that make sense? So that's how you can make more bonds because you have more orbitals available. So this is very important. Only elements from the third row and lower, they're able to do this. So that means your favorite elements, carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, they can't do it. Don't try to give them more than eight valence electrons, you're gonna get the question wrong. But phosphorus, sulfur, chlorine, yeah, they can do that. So highlighted in yellow, I listed some key elements that are able to have expanded valences. All right, technically um, the transition metals can do that too, 
It, it, it's just that we're not going to study transition metals. I'm not going to give you a question where you have to draw the structure of transition metals, so don't worry about that. But also, um, if you look on the periodic table, the one I highlighted in yellow, the bottom two rows, like cadmium, indium, like thallium, bismuth, you, you don't ever have to worry about those elements, okay? I will never give you a Lewis diagram question with those things. That's just silly. Um, they're too rare. So don't worry about the heavy metals. And also what's interesting is check out the noble gases. Krypton, xenon, and radon, they're all highlighted. Okay. Meaning that they are able to make covalent bonds. So it is a lie when we told you that all noble gases are inert. The lighter normal gases are inert. They are not able to bond. But the heavier ones, they are able to bond. You might be thinking, why? How is that possible? Noble gases are stable. They have full orbitals. They have full valence. Why would they bond? Well, the reason for that is because these noble gases, starting from krypton, they're really big. Okay? Their valence electrons are really far away from their nucleus. So as a result, they experience a really weak force of attraction from the nucleus. You see what I'm getting at? And if you have a really electronegative atom that come by, like fluorine, for example, fluorine is desperate for electrons. And fluorine just will rip electrons from basically anybody. And if fluorine gets into contact with a heavy noble gas like krypton or xenon or radon, Fluorine will force the noble gas to bond with it, okay? It's like a kidnapping. Fluorine basically kidnaps their electrons and, hey, this is mine, now we're sharing this, okay? You're gonna like that. So the noble gases will share those electrons with fluorine because fluorine is that badass. Fluorine is high in electronegativity. It is able to just steal their electrons against its will. So these noble gases can only bond with highly electronegative atoms, oxygen, fluorine, and chlorine. Those are number one, number two, and number three on the periodic table in terms of electronegativity. They won't bond with anybody else because they don't have the strength to take those electrons from those noble gases. So that's the reason. If you have to draw a Lewis diagram with the noble gas, um, it's just normal. Just draw it normally. Pretend it's any other element. There's no difference. Okay, yeah, and the transition metals, they can also do this. It's just, you know, we're not going to study them, so don't worry about it. All right, the rules. There's a lot, okay? The good news is most of these are exactly the same as normal molecular compounds. The first few bullet points are exactly the same. So the first one, count the total valence electrons. No problem. Next, the lowest electronegativity goes in the middle, okay? Carbon always in the middle. And then you bond with everybody else surrounding it. Okay, we did that already. You put the remaining electrons in to complete octets. You start with the most electronegative atom. Again, no change from before. Make sure everyone satisfies the octet rule. Again, nothing changed. You use the formal charges to check for the most favorable structure. All right, so that means you want as many zeros as you can possibly get. If you can't have all zeros, then you want the electronegative atom to take the negative charge. And if you have non-zeros, then you want them to be as close to zero as possible. You don't want twos, you don't want threes, okay? If you satisfy these, you probably have the most favorable structure. Now, if you are not satisfied, you can make double bonds. You can make additional double bonds exceeding eight electrons with the central atom if the energy level of that central atom is three or greater until you reach the most favorable structure. So what that means is the octet rule is not important for elements with shells greater than three, okay? What's important is that you satisfy the most favorable structure according to the formal charges. You can sacrifice the octet rule to appease formal charges. So let's look at some examples of this. The first one that we're gonna look at is one of the easier ones, sulfate. Okay, sulfate is a really common molecule. You deal with sulfate a lot, like sulfuric acid. 
So SO4 and 2 minus, what does it look like? You put sulfur in the middle because sulfur is less negative than oxygen. You surround the sulfur with the four oxygens. Notice that I separate the oxygens with 90 degree angles. That is the most optimum distance as far apart as possible. Sulfur has six valence electrons. Oxygen also has six and you have four of those. Because you have a two minus, you gotta count those two electrons as well. So that's a total of 32 valence electrons. All right, and you connect the sulfur with the oxygens spending eight electrons to do that. So you have 24 left. You have to take the 24 and put it back. Who gets the electrons first? Obviously the oxygens because they're more electronegative than the sulfur. So everybody gets six. Six times four is 24. Oh, look, would you look at that? Perfectly balances out. Okay, you use up all 24, you satisfy all of the oxygen. So let's sit back and you know, admire this beautiful structure right here. All the oxygens have eight valence electrons, so satisfy the octet, no problem. What about sulfur? Four bonds, eight valence electrons. Also satisfies the octet, no problem. So we're done, right? No, you, you would think that because everybody satisfied octets, but that's not what we're looking for anymore. Octets are no longer important. The formal charges, let's check. For the sulfur, six valence electrons, zero non-bonding, four bonds. So you have a formal charge of plus two. Okay, that doesn't look good. What about the oxygens? Well, they're all identical. So six valence electrons, six non-bonding electrons, one bond, so that's a negative one. Man. If you have this structure, you have no zeros in your formal charge and you have a disgusting plus two. All right, so this is very ugly. This should burn your eyes. You should fix that. What can you do to fix the formal charges? You, you want zeros. So any ideas, folks? You make some double bonds. Yeah, you start making double bonds to reduce the formal charges, okay? It doesn't matter what oxygen you pick, they're all the same. So I'm just gonna pick the top one. So, okay, let's make one double bond. And again, I rearrange the electron to reflect now it's 120 degrees. So once you do make that double bond, you lose the formal charge on that oxygen. It's negative one becomes zero, okay? The sulfur goes from plus two to plus one. Now, I, I skipped the calculation. I'm straight up telling you that it goes from plus two to plus one. If you don't believe me, check. Okay, that's better. But you can do better than that, right? Why stop here? Let's do another one. Let's make another double bond. So now that oxygen has zero. Sulfur goes from plus one to zero. So now you have three zeros. Let's step back and look at this. Is that good enough? you have two negative ones. The answer is yes. There's nothing you can do about those negative ones because sulfur is two minus. You have to have two negative ones in there somewhere. Somebody must have them. And it's best that the oxygen has them because oxygens are more negative than sulfur. If you make another double bond, then you have another zero on the oxygen, but then the negative will be transferred to the sulfur which is less stable than being on the oxygen. So you stop here. You make two double bonds and you stop. Okay, so you put square brackets, two minus. Let's check again. Sulfur, six valence electrons, minus zero non-bonding, minus six bonds, that's zero. The double bond oxygens have zero because six minus four minus two. The single bond oxygen, nothing changed, you have negative one. So this is way more stable than our previous structure. So this is our correct answer. That's the structure of sulfate. This is counterintuitive. I'm sorry? What does the negative ones mean again? Wouldn't the negative ones do what? What do they mean again? What do they mean? Oh, it means that this atom is negative and that charge is found on the oxygen. Okay, it has a net charge of two minus, right? 
That means you have two extra electrons. Where are they? It's on the oxygens. Each of these oxygen has one additional electron. So that's why they're negative one. You always want the, the atom with most electron activity to take. Yeah, that, that's the ideal. Now, I wouldn't say always because you will see later with another example, this is not the case. Sometimes you have exceptions, but if you can help it, do it, okay? So this is the correct answer here. This is counterintuitive because you arrived at a seemingly good answer with everybody having eight valence electrons. You've been raised to believe that everyone wants eight. So you might want to stop there, but don't. Check with formal charge, otherwise you're going to regret it. Okay, check with formal charge to see whether it is the most stable. It tells us it's not, so this is the best structure. Okay, so sulfur has six bonds. That's fine. Sulfur can have more than eight valence electrons. You good? Also, it doesn't matter which two oxygen you choose. It doesn't matter. It's residence, right? So, in fact, these bonds will break and reform. So, all of these oxygen will take turns making double bonds with that sulfur. I just happened to choose those two. It doesn't really matter. Yep. Thank you. Okay, here is example two. Example two is one of the easiest questions uh, that has an expanded valence. So I'll give you two minutes and then I'll take that up. Okay. Okay, so POCL3. So first of all, you have to decide who goes in the middle. Okay. And it is phosphorus because it has the lowest electronegativity and it has the highest bonding capacity. So that one must be in the middle. And then you will surround it with the four other atoms. Again, it doesn't matter where you put the oxygen, you can just rotate the atom and it's all the same thing. So valence electrons, phosphorus has five. Oxygen got six, chlorines have seven and there's three of them, you add them up, 32 in total, okay? Hold on, let me, oh wait, no. Okay, and then you connect them each with a single bond using up eight electrons, so 24 left. You have to put this back into your molecule. Oxygen gets it first because oxygen is more negative than chlorine, so you get six. And then the rest of the chlorine get the remaining 18, you just happen to use up all 24. And again, this looks beautiful because everybody has eight valence electrons and you might think you're done. Check your formal chart. It's, it's going to tell you that this is wrong. Okay, so instead you need to make a double bond with the phosphorus from the oxygen, not the other ones. Now, because the oxygen right now carries a negative one, the phosphorus is plus one. So the oxygen should make the double bond because oxygen naturally makes two bonds. So this is the best structure. Check in the formal charge. For phosphorus, five minus zero minus five, that's good. Oxygen, no, six minus four minus two, also zero. Chlorine, seven minus six minus one. Okay, so you have full zeros. That's the perfect structure. Again, the phosphorus breaks the octet rule. It has five bonds instead of four, and that's okay. Wait, All right, so we're good? How do you determine that it's the oxygen that does the double bond and not a chlorine? In this okay, right. If you do it with the chlorine, you will screw up the formal charges. Only with oxygen would you get three zeros. Okay, let's do one with chlorine. Let's just see what happens. So let's say that I take that and I make a double bond right here. Yeah. So let's calculate the formal charge of that chlorine then. So chlorine would have um, seven valence electrons minus then you will have four non-bonding electrons and two bonds and that will be plus one okay so, so you turn a zero that. into a plus one that's the opposite of what you want to do okay. okay so formal charges will tell you what to do okay you good yeah thank you All right. let me let that student in all right next one so this is one of the hardest questions you can get with Lewis diagram, this is ridiculous. ICL4 with one minus. Okay, we're gonna go through this slowly. You're gonna decide what's in the middle. 
it doesn't take you know, very long to decide that, hey, iodine should be in the middle. That's the lowest electronegativity, okay? And I think you've noticed a pattern by now, like the rare one goes in the middle. You see, because there's four chlorines. Iodine has seven, chlorines also have seven, and you have a one minus, that adds up to 36, and you use up eight of them to connect the iodines to the chlorines. So minus eight, you have 28. Okay, make sure you don't make a mistake at this stage, because very, very common mistakes um, are just calculation errors. You followed everything correctly, but you, know, you made a calculation error. You got the wrong number of electrons, so therefore the wrong structure. That's, that's quite upsetting. So make sure that you add them up very carefully. So you have 28 left. You need to give it to the chlorines. So there, have 24. Then you have four left. The only option is to give those four electrons to the iodine. And you use up 28 and you have a zero. Okay, so already that looks ugly. Notice that when I give the extra electrons to the iodine, I'll make sure you pair them up. I don't care where you put them around the iodine, make sure that they're paired. Don't dot them like north, south, east, west. Okay, don't do that. Two pairs because electrons come in orbitals and each orbital has two electrons. Okay, so let's check. Chlorine, oh sorry, iodine first. Seven electrons minus four bonds, minus four bonding, non-bonding electron, that's negative one. Chlorine, seven minus six minus one, zero. Okay, so the net charge for this is minus one, so you're gonna have a minus one in there somewhere. And so here is one of those examples where it's okay for the iodine to bear the negative charge. I said that the most electronegative atoms should bear the negative charge, so you would think that you wanna make a double bond. Now, very inexplicably, like honestly, I don't know why, but the structure for this one is just like that. The iodine has a negative one, and that's okay. Yeah, I don't know why this is the exception. That's just the way it is. So just remember, ICL4 minus, all single bonds. Right, sorry, does that make sense? Um, I have a question for uh, example three, because it's yeah. uh, comparing to the sulfate example. Isn't yeah. it added up all the um, formal... Um, Formal charge, it should be equals to the net charge of the molecule. So yeah. what sulfates when you add it up, it doesn't equal to to negative two minus, but this one it is equal to one minus. No, no, it did. For sulfate, it did, right? Two oxygens, both with one minus, so that adds up to two minus. But this one, the iodine has to one minus, and that is just charge of one minus. You see how this yeah. works? Yeah, sure. Thank you. No problem. Any other questions? Is there more cases like this? Not that I know of. This is the only one that, to my knowledge, has this weird exception that I don't know how to explain. That's why I'm showing you this. So it's okay, not, the other one should follow the rules. We just have to memorize it. It's not logical. I mean, yeah. Like, cause when I drew this using the rule, I made a double bond. Because yeah. I thought I was right. And then one day, um, I, I searched it up and I came across, wait, hold on, wait, what? So I, I did some research. I couldn't figure out why that this was the structure. But this is the structure. I just don't know why. Okay. So, I, so probably not going to put that on a test, to be fair. Okay. Like your test is going to have these weird ones, but probably not that one. <laughs> you see what I mean? Yeah. All right. So let's move on to example four. I'll have you guys do this uh, because this is relatively easy. That's another polyatomic ion you're familiar with, perchlorate. So follow the rules. Uh, don't, don't worry about the octet rule, follow the formal charges. Okay, I'll take this up in two minutes. Okay, so uh, with perchlorate, chlorine is obviously in the middle with a lower electronegativity and chlorine has seven valence electrons. Oxygen's got six and you have four of those and don't forget that one minus charge, they add up to 32. 
All right, so if you use eight of them to connect the chlorine to the oxygen, you would have 24. And if you just distribute the 24 evenly amongst the four oxygens, you should use up all of them and you have nothing left. And despite the fact that this satisfies the octet for everyone, this is not the right answer. If you check the formal charge, it's going to be disgusting. For chlorine, you have 7 minus 0 minus 4, you have a plus 3, ouch. And for all of your oxygens, you have a minus 1 each. So you have a glaring plus 3 and everybody minus 1, you know you got to do something about that. And the thing you do is you make double bonds to reduce the formal charges. Again, it doesn't matter which oxygen you choose, you just grab one and share those electrons. So now the plus three becomes a plus two and that oxygen loses the negative one and becomes zero. Right? And you do this again because the plus two is still unacceptable. You grab another oxygen, you make another double bond that clears the negative one from the oxygen and now it becomes plus one on the chlorine. There's no reason to not do this again because you can see a plus one, a negative one. So if you make another double bond, you clear all the formal charges except one on that last oxygen. And that's when you stop. Okay, because perchlorate has a minus one net charge. So you have to have a minus one somewhere and it is best that oxygen has it and not chlorine because oxygen is more negative. So if you check now, chlorine, seven electrons, minus zero non-bonding, minus a whopping seven bonds, that's a zero. Oxygen, um, the double bond ones of six minus four minus two, zero. And the last one, six minus six minus one is negative one. So you have mostly zeros, only one of them being a negative one, that's fine. This is the proper structure. This is perchlorate. Okay, that looks very scary as a structure, but no, logically, it makes sense. Okay, so this is telling you that chlorine can actually make seven bonds, not just one bond we learned in grade 10 and 11. All right, chlorine is actually able to make seven bonds because it has an expanded valence. Okay, we're good? All right, so now it gets disgusting. Xenon tetrafluoride. Okay, again, xenon is a noble gas, but noble gases can react with fluorines because fluorines are so bossy, they would just rip electrons from anybody. So let's draw the structure of the xenon tetrafluoride. Obviously, xenon has to be in the middle because fluorine is the most electronegative atom there is. So xenon in the middle. Okay, four fluorines, 90 degrees, from each other. Let's count the valence electron. Now here is when I have to go back on my words. I told you that noble gases all have zero valence electrons. While that's correct, and xenon is a noble gas, we can't actually put a zero for this xenon. Okay, because this xenon is making chemical bonds. So those electrons are being used for chemical bonding purposes. So they're no longer counting towards a noble gas electron where they don't do anything. Okay, so they did do something. So they become valence electrons. So it's eight instead of zero. You see how this works? Xenon has eight valence electrons if it makes any bonds. Fluorine has seven and there's four of those. They add up to 36. You use four of them and you minus eight you have 28. Okay, fluorine gets it first because they're the most electronegative. Six on each fluorine, you have 20, uh, 24. Four electrons re remain, you give those to the xenon. So you spend 28, you arrive at zero, and you check the structure. Does that make sense? Okay, that looks ugly, but does that make sense? Xenon, eight valence electrons, minus four non-bonding electrons, minus four bonds, zero. Okay, that's nice. The fluorine, seven minus six minus one, again, zero. Very nice. So this is the correct structure for xenon tetrafluoride. Okay, you have two sets of lone pairs on the xenon. 
So make sure you write it as such. Okay, when you draw your diagram, make sure that the lone pairs are actually pairs. They're beside each other. Okay, don't just put them in random places. Okay, you good? Yep. All right, so the next one is another noble gas, radon dichloride. Now, this one is the same as the previous one. You just follow the same rules. Radon will have eight valence electrons, okay? That's in the middle, two atoms, so it's a straight line. Eight for radon, seven for chlorine, 22 in total. 14 plus eight is 22. Four electrons are used for those two bonds, so 18 left. You take that 18, you drop six on each fluorine, oh, sorry, chlorine, so you spend 12, and you would have six remaining. And the only other atom you can give those six electrons to is that radon. So here, have six. You spend 18. Let's check the structure. Does that make sense to you? Radon has eight valence electrons, six electrons non-bonding, and two bonds. That's a zero. Chlorine is seven minus six minus one. Again, zero. So that would be radon dichloride. Okay, this is a linear molecule. Any questions? All right, cool. So this is getting repetitive because the rules are the same. It's just that the molecules themselves are different. So if you just apply all of the rules in order, you should 100% get the right answer every time. The last example that I want to look at is SL2. Okay, SL2 is interesting because it's deceptively hard. It looks easy because it looks a lot like CO2. Okay, and CO2 is easy, but SO2 is actually really difficult. There's a sneaky trick. CO2, NO2, SO2. Okay, only CO2 is easy. Despite being non-metal oxides, only CO2 is easy to draw. The other two are hard to draw, okay? So SO2 is actually one of those that breaks the rule. Now let's actually try this. Sulfur in the middle, you put the oxygens on each side, just like carbon dioxide. That's how you would start carbon dioxide. So let's count. Sulfur has six. Oxygen has six, but there's two of them. So a total of 18. You put a dash in between. Minus four. You have 14. Okay, you give the 14 to the oxygens first. So you drop six on each oxygen. So you use up 12, you have two remaining. You must give the two remaining electrons to the sulfur. And so you use up all of your electrons and you get to here. Now here is where the fun games begin. What do you do from here? Can somebody tell me what you do from this step? You bend it. <laughs> right, okay, you have to bend it, but let's finish the structure first and then bend it. You see what I'm saying? You make the double bond. Okay, let's make a double bond. So if you make a double bond, let's look. Everybody has eight valence electron. Do you agree? And if that's the case, well, that looks finished, doesn't it? So let's bend the molecule and be done with it. That's what a lot of people would think and then you get it wrong, okay? This is deceptive because that looks finished. It's not like you didn't do anything. I mean, I made a double bond. I did something and I satisfy all the octets. So if this question were to be given to a grade 11 student, they will give me this and they'll feel really good and they'll think they get it right because they checked all the boxes. All the valence electrons are eight, and this looks good, but in fact, this is wrong because we learned formal charges. You must make another double bond, okay? Why is that? So let's check. For sulfur, six valence electrons, subtract two non-bonding electrons, subtract four bonds is zero. And then oxygen naturally makes two bonds, so that must be zero. So only then do you get zeros across the board this is the right structure. 
And then you bend the molecule because you have the two dots. You must push the two double bonds down. You can have a linear structure if you have additional electrons in your center atom. Well, unless you have three pairs, then you still have linear. But if you have one pair, you better bend that. So 120 degrees for the angles. This is the final structure of SO2. All right, so there are many pitfalls in one question. So that's an innocent looking question, SO2, that's it. But that's actually a difficult question. You can fail in many different places. All right, does that make sense for everybody? Follow the rules. You don't stop when you just do one double bond. You continue until all the formal charges are zero. Any questions about anything today? That's the last example. All right, if not, I just want to, again, remind you, now that you've learned expanded valences, so now you know that certain elements can break the octet rule, I just want to remind you to not be trigger happy with this rule, okay? Don't give anything like extra bonds just because you want to get rid of the formal charges. Again, only elements in row three and below can do this. Okay, I've seen that many students after learning this, they get so excited when they see a carbon, a nitrogen, an oxygen. You'd be like, hey, let me just give you more bonds so that you know all the formal charges are zero and you get it wrong because those elements are unable to make more than eight, uh, more than four bonds. Okay, they must have a maximum of eight. Only sulfur and row three and below, you can have more than that. So just keep that in mind when you do practice questions and especially the test. Okay, so from this point onwards, I have a lot of practice for you. There are four slides of practice, each slide having two questions. Um, they have an increasing level of difficulty after every slide. So the first slide, novice practice, this is very easy. Um, a grade 10 students can do that. You go all the way to the master level practice where that's just ridiculous. Another level of difficulty with these questions is I mix them up. So you don't know which ones have exceptions, which ones don't. So make sure that you are careful when you do them. So I'll give you around 20 minutes. And then after 20 minutes, I will take them up and make sure you check your answers with mine. Uh, make sure they're correct. Okay, so I'll give you 20 minutes. I'll come back at five o'clock. Okay. All right, I'm gonna take this up. The first page is ridiculously easy. All right, so these are grade 10 level questions. Oxygen O2, I mean, there you have it, oxygen double bond. Methane, carbon with four hydrogens. It doesn't get easier than that. The next page gets more difficult. Uh, BF3, that one is one of those exceptions. Boron just needs six. So the correct structure looks like that. If you are tempted to give a double bond with one of the fluorines to the boron to make eight electrons to the boron, please don't because for two reasons. Reason number one, is that you will ruin the formal charge. Right now, everybody has zero. If you form a double bond between the F and the B, then fluorine will have a formal charge of plus one, boron will be negative one. That's not the most stable configuration. Another reason is that because fluorine is so electronegative, it is so, it strongly holds on to its electron, okay? Boron is very uh, electro positive. That means it doesn't really take electrons uh, with great force. It is unable to take electrons from fluorine. It is not strong enough. So that double bond will not be made. So BF3 looks exactly like this with single bonds. Next one, SF6. This sulfur has six bonds with one fluorine each. So that's what it looks like. Okay, so that one uh, you should have gotten is one of the easier uh, exceptions to the rule. 
All right, so the next page is harder than this one. Nitrate, here's nitrate. Now, why do I say this is difficult? This doesn't look very difficult. Well, because of the potential mistakes people can make with this, when you check the formal charges, you're gonna realize nitrogen is plus one, the two oxygens are minus one. And you're very tempted to just give another double bond to the nitrate, sorry, to the nitrogen, so that the nitrogen will have a zero formal charge and the oxygen will have a zero formal charge and you have more zeros. And more zeros are more desirable. But we don't do that, okay? We don't do that because nitrogen is unable to make more than four bonds. It is in row number two. The exception does not apply to nitrogen, so that's the best you can do, okay? Having the one plus ones and the two minus ones. So that's nitrate. Same thing with ozone, O3. You have three oxygens, and one of them has a double bond, the other one has a single bond, and as a result, you have a plus one and a minus one on the formal charges of two oxygens. And you can make them all zeros if you just you know, form another double bond. But you can't do that. Oxygen is in row two. So this is the best you could do. Oxygen can only have eight valence electrons, so you're, you're gonna have to just live with the plus one and the minus one. Okay, and by the way, ozone is also bent because you know, there's a lone pair up there. So this is O3. Any questions so far? Okay, and by the way, both of these have resonance structures. You just have to give me one of them. The hardest page, um, selenium tetrafluoride. And that looks like that. It's, that's just ridiculous. You have one lone pair on the selenium with four Fs. Okay, so check your answers to see whether you got that one. And then the last one is called xenate. This is a polyatomic ion. You've probably never seen that one but this does exist and there's something called xenic acid as well. So xenate is XeO4 with two minus. And if you just follow all the rules, this is just like sulfate, the SO4, except this has two additional electrons and the xenon would have that. And you will make two double bonds to get rid of all the formal charges and only formal charges left are the negative ones on the two oxygens. And that would be xenate. All right, so I hope you got all of these correct. On your test, this is as hard as it gets, okay? You're not gonna see anything more crazy than this. So this is Lewis diagrams. Um, let me just show you a video to summarize Lewis diagrams and then we're done. So I just wanna end this by um, reminding you that um, the homework I have posted already, uh, it's in that package I posted. And also I posted a separate sheet on Google Classroom under the lesson where you find the PowerPoints. So make sure you get enough practice because tomorrow we're going to draw Lewis diagrams in three dimensions. Okay, today it's all 2D and the angles are actually not accurate. The most accurate representation of molecules are the 3D models that we will learn how to draw tomorrow. So you must know how to draw Lewis diagrams in order to learn that. All right, so do we have any final questions? Okay, um, so I'm gonna stop the recording here.